Real Estate. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, a low emission zone came into force in Glasgow. It will prevent many vehicles from entering the city centre, uh, and if a driver breaks the rules, they could face hefty fines into hundreds of pounds. So can the First Minister tell us how many vehicles applied for an exemption to this scheme but were refused? First Minister. Uh, first of all, this is, of course, a scheme run by Glasgow City Council. It's a scheme that I am very supportive of and of course I think all of the Parliament should be supportive of the low emission zones. Why? Because we know of course that air pollution is a serious problem particularly in our city conurbations, particularly in Glasgow and that's why of course the introduction of the LEZ has been welcomed by the likes of uh, Asthma and Lung UK as well as many other uh, third sector organisations with an interest in public health. I don't have the exact figure uh, to hand that Douglas Ross uh, has asked for, but I do know, of course, that there has been, uh, there has been an LEZ exemptions process that has been put uh, in place, and, of course, a number of time-limited exemptions uh, have been granted. Uh, but what I would say to Douglas Ross is I do hope that, uh, in his questioning, uh, he will be unequivocal in his support for LEZs, because, of course, every single week, rightly so, members of this parliament question this government on what more we can yeah. do to tackle the climate emergency. Yeah. In the Conservatives' case, every time we bring forward a measure, or indeed our local authorities yeah. bring forward a measure, they seem to oppose it time absolutely. and time every and time, time again. So it is absolutely critical, absolutely critical for all of us that believe in tackling this climate emergency as a priority, that we don't just talk the talk, but we're prepared to walk the walk. Douglas Ross. Well, I really hope the First Minister would start answering questions rather than telling opposition leaders what they should be asking. Because, as usual with the SNP, the problem with this policy is the delivery. There have been numerous warnings about the implementation from people and organisations across Scotland. SNP members are saying this is an exaggeration. So let's just look at one of the many charities raising concerns. Joe Fitzpatrick, a government minister, wants to shout me down while I am speaking about a charity in Glasgow raising concerns. So maybe Joe Fitzpatrick, members. the First Minister and the SNP could listen to Homeless Project Scotland. They were refused an exemption and still they heckle. Homeless Project Scotland refused an exemption to use a refrigerated van within the restricted area. Their chairman, Colin McInnes, said it helps to feed 300 people every day. It collects food from 15 to 20 businesses in the city centre, right at the heart of the low emission zone. His message was simple. Exemptions for exceptional circumstances must be reviewed. Mr McInnes continued, if 300 people queuing for many hours for food on the streets of Glasgow is not exceptional, then they need to publish what is exceptional. Does Hamza Yusuf agree this outstanding charity deserves an exemption from this scheme? First Minister. I do commend uh, the work that's done by the Homeless Project uh, in uh, Glasgow. We do have to ask ourselves, of course, why are they having to feed so many people in any given week? And that's undoubtedly the case because of over a decade of Tory austerity, because of a cost of living crisis, because of Thank you. high inflation, because of high energy costs. That is why, of course, they're having to do the work that they're having uh, to do. I would urge Glasgow, as they have already done, in my understanding, to engage with the third sector, with charities, including, of course, the Homeless Project. Glasgow, and, uh, Glasgow have been very transparent. The application process for time-limited exemptions in Glasgow is published on the Glasgow City Council website. There has been, of course, a lead-in time in relation to the LEZ uh, being introduced. So we know, of course, that there is an exemption process, but clearly it is imperative on all of us, whether it's the public uh, who are in Glasgow, whether it's charities, whether it's the third sector, and all of us, to have to make sure we are doing everything possible in our gift to tackle the serious problems around air pollution. I go back to what I said in my first answer, presiding officer. Time and time and time again, Douglas Ross will stand up 
and demand we do more to tackle the climate emergency. But whether it's on DRS, whether it's on the workplace parking levy, yep. whether, of course, it's on LEZ, he will oppose. And why will he oppose? Not because, of course, not because uh, of, of course, uh, anything to do uh, with any principled uh, stance in relation to the climate emergency. He opposes it simply because the SNP proposes it, and that is not good enough. Douglas Ross, I oppose it when the SNP make a shambolic mess of every one of these schemes that they bring in. And the First Minister wants to commend Homeless Project Scotland, but refuses to stand up and say their one van, their one van that helps to feed 300 people every day should get an exemption. That is not commending a charity. That is condemning them and their inability now to do the work they want to do. The delivery of this scheme has been tone deaf to the needs of the city and charities like Homeless Project Scotland. Now, SNP members wanted to heckle me when I spoke about charities. Will they do the same when I now read out quotes from businesses? Because they've also been raising... Cons now it's cabinet secretaries don't want to hear what businesses in Glasgow think. I know Jenny Goruth used to be the transport minister, Mr. but Ross, she should be listening to these points just now. Mr. Ross, because please businesses continue. Businesses are saying this to politicians across the political spectrum, and SNP members think it's funny. So let's listen. Stephen Grant. It is funny when the health secretary is laughing at this. So Stephen Grant of Unite Glasgow Taxi Drivers has said, "This is Steve Grant. Unite Glasgow Taxi Drivers said this. This damaging and punitive plan is going to be devastating." for our trade without a shadow of a doubt. Local business owner William Payton, who runs a garage within the restricted zone, says it just feels like it's been poorly thought out and we've been left in a horrible position because of it. Stuart Patrick, Chief Executive Officer of Glasgow Chambers of Commerce, said while we are supportive of the aims of the LEZ, the Chamber does not support using it as a political measure to drive pri all private cars away from the city centre. And this morning, Donald MacLeod of the Nighttime Industries Association said, actually, what we've got here is going to be a low economy zone getting created. He's right, isn't he? And what does Hamza Youssef have to say to all these businesses and all their workers who are concerned that this scheme is going to put jobs at risk? First Minister. First and uh, foremost, uh, I go back to the point that there has, of course, been a considerable lead-in time for the Glasgow uh, LEZ coming into place, and there has been yeah. extensive engagement. Oh, it's fine for Douglas Ross to, to dish it out now, but he can't take it when he's standing up with his question. Um, let me, let me, let me, of course, uh, let me, of course, give Douglas Ross some of the facts around uh, the LEZ in Glasgow. Not only has it had uh, a lengthy and extensive uh, leading time, there has, of course, been a uh, considerable engagement with businesses, with the community, with the third sector, with uh, charities as well. And in terms of support uh, as well to support low-income households and small businesses get prepared, uh, the LEZ Support Fund did offer financial support towards the disposal of non-LEZ compliant vehicles. In 2020-2021, the LEZ Support Fund awarded £1.7 million in grants, £3.85 million in 2021 22 £5 million was awarded through the LEZ Support Fund in 2022-23. And that fund, uh, while it is now closed, of course, however, those uh, eligible uh, were encouraged, of course, to, to register their interest. And as a result of that fund, uh, the LEZ Support Fund, it resulted in over 2,500 non-LEZ compliant vehicles being disposed or retrofitted with cleaner technology. So there has been funding there, not just for, as I say, low-income uh, households, but in particular for small businesses uh, as well. So when it comes to tackling the climate emergency, something all of us in this chamber claim to have an interest in, yeah. claim to say that is it a priority, really is easy. The warm words are easy. The rhetoric is easy. Yeah. Taking action is the hard bit. Yeah. And this government will never shy away, nor should our local authorities, from taking the tough action yeah. that is required in order to tackle the biggest threat our planet faces. Yeah. Dr. Shaw. The, 
The only thing that answer proved is it took till question three for Hamza Youssef to find his pre-prepared script uh, in his folder on this issue. But this LEZ is the latest anti-driver policy from the SNP Thank you. that looks like being an absolute shambles in the making. So they've cut investment in roads, they're not tackling Scotland's pothole problems, they're not supporting uh, car drivers. They've Proposed, Members. They have proposed a car park tax and they are increasing the cost of driving across Scotland. Now approximately three quarters of a million vehicles in Scotland will be fined if they drive through this zone in Glasgow. The LEZ is hurting charities' ability to function. It's risking jobs and business leaders think it's going to create a low economy zone. Wouldn't it have been better, First Minister? to delay the scheme for a year and properly listen to the concerns of businesses, charities, individuals and organisations who have been raising these concerns, have been hoping for a change, but have been left with no answers, no response and a tone-deaf government who refused to listen to them. First Minister. And in the meantime, of course, if we had delayed more people would have suffered in terms of their asthma, more people would have suffered because of their lung conditions, more people would have suffered because of CPD, more of the citizens of Glasgow would have suffered dire health consequences because we know air pollution in Glasgow is nowhere near the standards that we want it to be and the LEZ of course will help with that. It is an undeniable fact, presiding officer, that every time this SNP government brings forward action to tackle the biggest threat our planet faces, that Douglas Ross and the Conservatives oppose time and time and time again. They, they oppose the workplace parking levy. They oppose, of course, the DRS uh, scheme, even though they had it in their manifesto uh, that they stood on. Douglas Ross, of course, stood on the manifesto for a deposit return scheme but now opposes it. And when we look to invest and unleash the potential of the green economy in the North East, what do we get from the UK government, from the Tory UK government? Complete and utter inaction. Yeah. Not a single penny of funding towards the Scottish Cluster Members. or the Acre or the Acorn project. Not a single penny to support the economy, the green economy. Members, First Minister. I think we're, we are not going to continue in this vein. We are representatives of the people of Scotland. We are sitting in the National Parliament. I'd be very grateful if all who are tuning in could hear answers and questions. Thank you. They don't, they don't want to hear about the fact that they have been utterly missing from taking any action to tackle the climate emergency here in Scotland. Let me end uh, by saying this to the Conservatives. When it comes to tackling the climate emergency, whether it's LEZs, whether it's DRS, the real potential for Scotland, of course, both from tackling the climate emergency and from an economic point of view, is unleashing the green potential of the North East and of Scotland. For a party that has plundered and taken £300 billion of revenue from the North East, the very least they could do is match our £500 million Just Transition Fund and help us to tackle the climate emergency that is affecting our globe. It's the biggest priority, the biggest threat this country and indeed the world faces. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the First Minister tell us how many Scots died last year while languishing on an NHS waiting list? First Minister. I don't have that uh, figure uh, to hand, Presiding Officer, but of course, uh, let me say right from the offset, as uh, First Minister, uh, I don't want a single person having to wait longer than they have to. I apologise, of course, to anybody uh, that is waiting unnecessarily on a waiting list uh, for uh, treatment. And I think most people will recognise, I hope most people will acknowledge the significant impact, of course, that the pandemic uh, has had, the biggest uh, challenge I think our NH NHS has ever faced in its almost 75-year uh, existence. So we are making uh, some progress in relation uh, to the targets that have been set to reduce uh, waiting times, both in terms of outpatients and inpatients. But I think the government, and I certainly would be the first to recognise that, of course, we have to do more. And that's why the recovery uh, of our NHS uh, is, is, a, is a significant priority, is the priority 
uh, for this government, and that's why we're investing a record £19 billion this year in order to help recover uh, that the NHS and reduce those waiting lists. Anna Sarwar. The, the number the First Minister was looking for is 18,390. That's over 18,000 families with a loved one who died waiting for treatment that could have prolonged or, in some cases, saved their lives. In 2017, 7,868 Scots died while on an NHS waiting list, and immediately before COVID, it was 13,211. And if this current trend continues, it will be over 20,000 this year. These aren't just numbers. These are people waiting in pain, many dying far too early, leaving behind heartbroken families. And as Health Secretary, Hamza Youssef failed to get a grip of NHS waiting lists, and on his watch, they grew by over 175,000. Nearly two years ago, he published a recovery plan for the NHS, and since then, things have got worse. So can the First Minister tell us clearly, when will his government meet the legal treatment time guarantee so that fewer Scots are losing their lives? First Minister. Can I say, Tanis, how he is, uh, of course, absolutely right to raise the issue of waiting lists and the fact that uh, they have increased throughout the course of the pandemic. I cannot uh, escape and will not uh, escape from that uh, matter of uh, fact. But the pandemic is not just a fleeting matter. It is not a matter that can just be mentioned and then uh, not, uh, not uh, fully explored in terms of the clear impact that it has had. Uh, there is no doubt that the pandemic has been the biggest shock that NHS, uh, I think, health services in Europe and globally uh, have faced. And that's not unique uh, to Scotland. Of course, uh, I am responsible uh, and we are responsible for the health service here uh, in Scotland, but it's clearly impacted in health services uh, right across uh, the UK. We are making progress uh, in relation to that recovery plan that Anna Sawar uh, mentions. For example, if I look at the outpatient uh, two-year uh, waits, uh, we've seen that numbers uh, are down 19 per cent from the last quarter, uh, crucially down almost 70 per cent from quarter two in 2022. In terms of uh, 12 month, uh, those that are waiting uh, a year or 12 months uh, in relation to outpatients, we know that since the target was introduced in quarter three 2022, the numbers of new outpatients mm -hmm. has reduced by over 15 per cent. If I look at inpatients, again, we've seen similar uh, decrease. If I look at inpatient day cases, those that have waited over uh, two years, we've seen those numbers uh, significantly uh, reduced, reduced by 27 per cent since those targets uh, were announced. And we can see a similar pattern in terms of improvement in relation to diagnostics as well. So uh, we are making uh, progress in relation to those targets. Uh, and we're also investing uh, record numbers uh, in, that, uh, in, our, in our NHS recovery and indeed in our social care recovery. But I've always been up front, whether it was when I was health secretary or my current uh, role as first minister, that the recovery of the NHS will not take weeks or months. It will take years. And that's why we have a five-year uh, recovery plan that I am absolutely committed in continuing to see progress in and committed to ensuring it has record investment alongside it. Anna Sarwar. Officer, as Health Secretary, Hamza Yusuf said he would have eradicated two-year waits by now, and he has patently failed. And things were getting worse before COVID, and things have got a lot worse in the two years since he published his NHS catch-up plan. And grieving families will see through these excuses. But this isn't even the full picture. According to FOI responses, thousands of people are forced to leave the NHS and pay for their treatment in the middle of a cost of living crisis. In one health board alone, the number has quadrupled between 2019 and 2023, and people without insurance paying for private treatment has increased by 73% since before the pandemic. 73%. Our NHS was built on the principle of healthcare free at the point of need, and that is clearly no longer the case for thousands of people in Scotland. So does the First Minister accept that his incompetence has created a two-tier NHS where people are forced to either go into debt in order to stop the pain and get the treatment they need or to languish on an NHS waiting list. First Minister. No, I, I don't agree with Anna Sawar's uh, characterisation. I'll come to why in just a second. It wasn't a list of excuses I read. It. I read it a list of facts. I read out some of the data, some of the statistics around some of the progress that has been made. Now, that is not to take away from individuals right across this country who are waiting far too long. We know that, of course, waiting on a waiting list uh, can have significant and severe consequences. That's why, for example, we are investing 
uh, in our national, national treatment centres. We have four uh, that are opening this year. A couple of them have already uh, opened. I'll be pleased in a couple of weeks' time to officially open uh, NTC uh, Highland. We have NTC Fourth Valley in the second phase of NHS Golden Jubilee uh, opening uh, later this year, and that will give us additional capacity. We know that uh, NTC uh, Fife plans uh, include 500 orthopaedic procedures uh, this year, rising more, to more than 700 uh, by 2025-2026. In, in the first year of opening, the first of the national, uh, national treatment centres, the, the National Eye Centre uh, in NHS Golden Jubilee, that delivered uh, almost 9,000 uh, cataract uh, procedures. So we are investing in that additional capacity. In terms of the use of private uh, health care. I don't want anybody to have to feel that the only choice they have to go to uh, is uh, private uh, health care. But to go to Anna Sawar's point, uh, this is not because the SNP uh, is in government. It's unique to Scotland. It is, of course, a situation that is affecting health services right across the entire UK. If I take private health care as an example, mm -hmm. the rate of people self-funding for private inpatient day case uh, care uh, is 19.9 per cent higher in England than it is here. In Wales, it's over 120 per cent higher than it is uh, here uh, in Scotland. So we know that these issues are affecting people uh, right across the UK. And the reason why, of course, uh, is the pandemic. But we'll continue to not just invest in the NHS. We'll continue to make sure our staff are the best paid uh, in uh, the UK. We'll make sure that we don't lose days uh, on strike. Of course, Scotland, the only part of the UK to ensure not a single day in the NHS was lost to strike uh, over the course of the winter. Yeah. And we'll continue to make sure we do everything we can to fill uh, those vacancies. But there can be no NHS recovery without a social care uh, recovery. And what hasn't helped social care, of course, uh, is Brexit, where, of course, we've seen, uh, th we've seen uh, many staff uh, leave social care uh, because of that hard Brexit that has been imposed on Scotland. So I'll continue to make sure that we have record amounts invested in the recovery of both our NHS and of social care too. Question number three, Ariane Burgess. To ask the First Minister what priority the Scottish Government gives to protecting Scotland's environment. First Minister. Scotland's natural environment is central to our identity as a nation. It's fundamental to our health, to our quality of life, to our economy. Uh, and this year, we're investing nearly a billion pounds in our natural environment. And of course, we remain committed to working with our partners in the Green Group on the priorities for net zero and for nature uh, that is set, in, uh, set out clearly uh, in the Butte House Agreement. So I and my government uh, are fully committed to protecting and enhancing Scotland's environment. But progress, of course, depends on us being able to use the powers that are fully devolved to this parliament. Just this week, of course, we've seen the UK government determined to ride roughshod over a measure to improve recycling, dramatically reduce litter by seeking to sabotage regulations that this parliament passed uh, on bottle and can recycling. And that, of course, is simply uh, unacceptable. Yep. Ariane Burgess. Handing on a clean and nature-rich environment to future generations is one of the biggest responsibilities of government. So it is astonishing to hear that the UK government, at a whim, is undermining our Parliament's effort to reduce litter and improve recycling by aiming to sabotage Scotland's deposit return scheme. Given that the Tory UK government was elected on a manifesto commitment to have a scheme which included glass, and given that Labour in Wales has joined Scotland in our shared commitment to a scheme with glass, does the First Minister believe that all members here should listen to the evidence, listen to their own promises and colleagues, and let Scotland get on with the job for which this Parliament voted? First Minister. Ariane Burgess is absolutely right to highlight what it can only be described as shameful hypocrisy of the Conservatives on this matter. Whether it's Rishi Sunak, whether it's Alistair Jack, of course, whether it's Douglas Ross, they stood on a manifesto promising a deposit return scheme that included glass. It was Morris Golden, of course, who told us that if you're going to do it, do it properly yeah. and include glass. Yeah. Uh, the Tory government has U-turned on its very own promises and indeed is going contrary to the evidence of what will help us to tackle this climate emergency, what will help us to increase uh, recycling rates, and what will help us to remove that litter, that glass that could be hazardous to children, to pets, from our streets, from our parks, and from our beaches. But it does not uh, stop, uh, of course, uh, at the Tories. Labour in Wales share Scotland's anger about the treatment of devolved parliaments. They share our ambition 
uh, to have glass uh, included. And there was a time when Labour in Scotland did stand up for the Scottish Parliament's right to make our own choices. I shudder to think what greats like John Smith or Donald Dewar, those architects of devolution, what they would be thinking about at Scottish Labour's complete and utter silence at the fact that the Conservatives, time and time again, want to undermine devolution. So what the latest action, what the latest action from the Conservatives have shown us is that the Tories, they're bad for business in Scotland, they're bad for the environment, they're bad for devolution. No wonder they've never won an election here in the last 50 years, and I suspect if they keep going, they won't win another one for another 50 years, Presiding Officer. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This government has cut the total forestry and land budget by 3.4 million. It has cut the environmental quality budget by 3.9 million. And it has cut Scottish Water's budget by 1.8 million. Isn't this his own shameful hypocrisy trotting out warm words on protecting Scotland's environment with these cold cuts? First Minister. We have, of course, uh, an excellent record when it comes to the forestry, when it comes to, for example, peatland restoration, when it comes to taking action to tackle the climate emergency. And, of course, as I've said already uh, to his uh, leader, the branch uh, manager, uh, the branch officer, manager uh, Douglas Ross, every time we bring forward a proposal, we bring forward a measure to tackle the climate emergency. It's opposed by the Conservatives time and time and time again. If we waited for the Conservatives, if we went at their glacial pace, there won't be a planet for future generations to enjoy. So what we'll continue to do is make sure we don't just talk the talk, but we walk the walk, that we put our money where our mouth is. It would be great if Liam Kerr could use any, any influence he has. I know he doesn't have much, but if he has any influence with his colleagues in London to make sure they do the right thing uh, by Scotland, by the climate emergency, and for goodness sake, finally give us at least a penny of investment into the ACORN project, into the Scottish cluster that can help us to tackle the climate emergency. Yeah. Question number four, Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that the Community Pharmacy Scotland Board has described the financial settlement that it has been offered as derisory. First Minister. Community pharmacies are a key point of access to NHS healthcare. They provide uh, the, right the right care in the right place uh, at the right time. And discussions are ongoing with Community Pharmacy Scotland on the financial settlement uh, for 23-24. We will build on the increased funding that we've provided year on year for the last five years for community pharmacy services. Uh, this has delivered over £25 million in additional remuneration funding. We've also recently added an additional £20 million to the value of the drug tariff this financial year to address the increase in cost of medicine. Uh, we look forward to a continued engagement with Community Pharmacy Scotland. Christine Graham. Uh, first, I thank the First Minister for his answer, and I do hope discussions conclude shortly, recognising the key role they play in sustaining the health and well-being of our constituents. And on the, on the line of delivering the right care at the right time and the right place, does the First Minister agree with me that pharmacies such as the High Street uh, Pharmacy in Lauder and the larger chain pharmacy Boots and Gala Shields, for example, both in my constituency, with their expanding professional services, also ease pressure on GPs and even accident and emergency services, emphasising yet again their key role in our health service. First Minister. Uh, Christine Graham is absolutely right. Uh, they, they do provide uh, an exceptional service, uh, whether that's in terms of uh, minor, ail minor ailments, whether that's in relation to the pharmacy first uh, services that they provide, and all the other range of services that are pharmacists, whether they are uh, small independent pharmacies or whether they're, of course, part uh, of uh, larger, uh, larger uh, chains. Uh, what I would say to Christine Graham to give her some level of uh, reassurance that we are committed to continuing uh, to fund those vital uh, services. Uh, since its introduction, for example, Pharm Pharmacy First has become uh, established as a key part of the remobilisation uh, of the NHS. I'm grateful uh, to all pharmacy contractors, all pharmacy staff, for continuing to support this vital element of primary care in Scotland. Uh, it is funded uh, separately, but current annual funding of £30.8 million is allocated for pharmacy first, including £10 million of new funding, which was invested between 2020, 2021 and 
uh, 23. So uh, I agree with uh, Christine Graham about the excellent services that are provided by pharmacies right across the country. And as I mentioned in response to her first question, those discussions and negotiations with Community Pharmacy Scotland are ongoing and hopefully we'll get uh, hopefully to an, agreeable, uh, to, uh, to an agreed position. Carol Mockin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In his written response to my question, as then Health Secretary Hamza Yusuf said that the previous financial package ensured continuous expansion in the quality and number of services that can be offered by community pharmacy contractors to local communities. Just this week, following a new offer made by the government he now leads, we are being warned that opening hours may reduce and services could be cut back. How has it gone so badly wrong yet again on his watch? And will he personally be meeting with community of pharmacy representatives to resolve this important issue? First Minister. Well, of course, the uh, pharmacy sector is not immune to the high energy costs, high inflation costs that are affecting everybody in every single business right up and down the country. And of course, we have called on the UK government to do more. They have not done enough. Uh, of course, to address uh, many of the issues that, of course, were of their making. But what is in our gift is to ensure that we are giving appropriate resource and funding uh, to uh, pharmacy services here and Scotland, in Scotland. And we've increased funding year on year for the last five years for community pharmacy services. Uh, and indeed, in Scotland, the government spends £52 per person per year on pharmaceutical uh, services, where Carol Mockins uh, party uh, are in charge. It is not as high uh, as that. In terms of uh, England, if I look at where the Conservatives are in charge, uh, that figure is £46 per person uh, in England. So we'll continue to invest, we'll continue to make sure we adequately fund pharmacies uh, right up and down this uh, country. I'm really grateful for the services that are provided by our, pharma by our pharmacists and pharmacy staff. Uh, as I say, the length and breadth uh, of the country. And I am uh, confident, I'm hopeful, uh, we will get uh, to an agreed position, uh, hopefully sooner uh, rather than later. Sandish Gilhani. Thank you. This development, as described by the First Minister as recent, it was actually just yesterday, and it was the community pharmacist that said that the offer was derisory when they rejected it before this money was put in. But I welcome this money following pressure from community pharmacy and myself uh, because it does ease some of the... Well, um, I'm glad the SNP are laughing because they clearly don't care about oh, community pharmacists. Exactly, exactly. It eases some of the cost pressures on the community pharmacy networks whilst the negotiations continue. Will the Scottish Government underwrite the risk that the network is carrying on behalf of the NHS so that they can continue to supply essential medicines and support the people of Scotland with the full service offering. First Minister. Can I just remind the Chamber that Dr Sanders Gohani has nothing to do with the negotiations that we're taking forward oh, with exactly. Community Pharmacy Scotland. Exactly. Uh, the investment, of course, is coming from the Scottish Government and, of course, uh, the Health Secretary and the Minister for Public Health are involved uh, in those discussions with Community uh, Pharmacy uh, Scotland. What I will do is make sure that we continue to fund uh, pharmacies and pharmacists right up and down the country to the level that they uh, require. Of course, they are facing these challenges because of the pressures of inflation, because of high energy costs, because of energy bills. And of course, there are some global factors which are affecting medicine prices as well. And that's why the Scottish Government ensured that we uh, gave additional funding, additional £20 million, to the value of the drug tariff in the current financial year. So we'll continue uh, with our engagement, uh, in our engagement with Community Pharmacy Scotland. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful for the excellent services that they provide, as I say, right across the length and breadth of Scotland. Question number five, Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is regarding recent reports that suggest there is a mental health crisis emerging in the early years sector. First Minister. The unprecedented pressures of the past few years, including Brexit, the COVID pandemic, the cost crisis, they are, of course, taking a toll on a number of people's mental health, including uh, early year staff. I'm particularly grateful to everyone in the workforce for continuing to operate as key workers throughout this difficult time. That's why since October 2020, the Scottish Government has invested over £2 million in the well-being of the education workforce. We've also worked with Early Years Scotland to develop Team ELC Wellbeing Hub specifically to support professionals. Uh, this builds on what local authorities as direct employers are doing to support the well-being uh, of those that they employ. Megan Gallagher. 
Presiding officer, I have been raising concerns over an emerging childcare crisis since being elected to this parliament. This SNP government have done nothing to fix the problems in our childcare sector. Now more than 8,000 nursery and childcare staff have taken sick leave because of stress or mental health concerns. These ab absences are indicative of a childcare crisis with more than nine in 10 councils unable to fully fund free childcare. Nurseries are closing their doors and parents are without childcare for their children. Audit Scotland has even said the sector is fragile. First Minister, earlier petitioners are children's first educators. They are being let down by this government. Will he therefore meet with me and nursery providers to discuss the 1140-hour policy since he has expressed an interest to expand the provision as part of his leadership bid? First Minister. Of course, uh, we do offer the most generous offer of childcare anywhere uh, in, in the UK. I'm really proud of what we've achieved, that 1140 uh, hours. I do recognise the challenges that are faced by the sector, and that's why uh, Natalie Don, the, the, the Minister of course, for Children and Young People, uh, and for the Minister responsible for keeping the promise, met with the PVI sector, I believe, just uh, this week, but certainly uh, recently. And of course, I'll ensure that the government continues to engage, be it with Megan Gallagher uh, or indeed with the sector. Uh, directly. And I do take this issue uh, of uh, mental health uh, very, very seriously indeed. That's why, as I say, uh, we have invested uh, over £2 million in the well-being uh, of uh, the education workforce and working with local authorities uh, in relation to what more can be done, particularly for ELC staff. What we're also making sure that we are doing to help with these challenges, be it the mental health challenges, be it the workload pressures, uh, be it, of course, the cost crisis that uh, her party have created, is making sure that we pay staff. Uh, we may ensure that staff are well paid, those that work, of course, in uh, early learning and childcare. So before the expansion of uh, early learning at childcare began, approximately 80 per cent of staff delivered, uh, delivering uh, funded ELC uh, were paid less than the living wage. In contrast, our 2021 health check indicated that 88 per cent of private providers intended to pay uh, the real living wage to the staff from August uh, 2021. So we'll continue our focus on making sure that we expand uh, childcare. We know the benefits that it can have for parents, for families, particularly uh, the disproportionate, the, the positive disproportionate impact it can have on women entering into the workforce. So we'll continue our focus uh, on that and we'll continue to engage, uh, be it with Megan Gallagher, but more importantly, uh, with the PVI sector too. Clear Hawkey. Thank you, President Officer. Recent research by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation found that a quarter of adults in Scotland have accessed the NHS due to the impact of the cost of living crisis on their mental or physical health. Can the First Minister outline what progress can be made through existing powers to protect workers, including those in our childcare sector, from being further impacted by this crisis? First Minister. Well, uh, Claire Hawkey is absolutely right, of course, to raise uh, these issues. And we will do everything we can in our gift to use the powers of devolution to their absolute maximum to help particularly those uh, that are the most vulnerable, particularly helping those uh, in the lowest income households. And that's why uh, I was really pleased this week to visit Castlebury uh, Community uh, Campus and meet with not just young people, but also uh, parents and families that have been uh, impacted and helped uh, by the Scottish Child Payment. 303,000 children now in receipt of the Scottish Child uh, Payment, a game-changing intervention from this government. Now, on top of that, of course, uh, many other benefits uh, that are only available in Scotland uh, now being awarded through Social Security Scotland. So we'll do everything we can in our gift uh, to try to help with the cost of living crisis, which clearly has a mental health impact on many people across the country. The unfortunate uh, the unfortunate problem, of course, is that for all the good that we can do, uh, the UK government, with their over a decade of austerity, with their cost of living crisis, with the many budget that wrecked the economy, uh, we are having to spend not millions, presiding officer, but billions of pounds trying to mitigate the worst effects of Conservative austerity. If Scotland has to continue to do that, that means less and less money spent on education, on health, on transport and justice. And that, to me, presiding officer, is simply not acceptable. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Minister if, First Minister, if any objections or concerns are raised by Scottish Ministers about the guidelines for sentencing under 25s in Scotland, which came into effect in January 2022. 
First Minister. In line with the requirements agreed by this Parliament, the content of sentencing guidelines is, of course, entirely a matter for the independent uh, judge-led Scottish Sentencing Council. As part of the consulta consultation the Council uh, undertakes on guidelines, Scottish ministers were cited uh, on a near final draft of the guideline. Uh, I replied at the time as Cabinet Secretary for Justice, uh, noting that the Council had taken an evidence-led collaborative approach in developing the draft guideline, uh, promoting rehabilitation, early intervention and alternatives to custody and ultimately working to reduce reoffending. I'm pleased that reoffending levels have fallen over the last decade and this is helping to keep our communities safe. It should be noted that the position in the guideline is that custody is of course still an option for sentencing young people and is of course completely right that this option remains available to the court in any given case. The Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Home Affairs, Angela Constant, met very recently with Lady Dorian to discuss how the Council plans to keep these guidelines under review. Holly McNeill. We know that there have been at least two reported cases where there is public concern about the leniency of sentencing. Firstly, in the case where there was no jail sentence for the rape of a 13-year-old girl. But secondly, on the horrific rape and murder of Joe Barclay, where there was a reduction in sentence of four years. So the First Minister has confirmed today that he sees no role for the Parliament, but only for the Sentencing Council. That it seems that it's nothing to do with this Parliament, as far as the First Minister is concerned. Now, I wonder if the first... It's a very significant change in sentencing policy. Now, is the First Minister aware that this Parliament did have a say when it came to the discounting of sentencing in relation to early pleas? So I don't understand why at least Parliament wouldn't have a say in this. When it comes to horrific crimes, as serious as rape and murder... Does the First Minister believe that there should be a reduced sentence for under-25s? But at least, should he at least give Parliament some comfort that he believes that, that this Parliament should some oversight on significant changes to sentencing policy in Scotland? First Minister. What I would say to, to Pauline McNeill, who I know has uh, a, a long-standing interest in uh, these matters, is that, of course, there was a public consultation when it came to the guideline. Now, I don't know whether Polly McNeill or the Scottish Labour Party responded to that public consultation, but every single guideline does go through yeah. that public consultation process, quite a lengthy process, uh, before that guideline is eventually approved uh, by uh, the, 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 the High Court. And, of course, as I said, as a, from a Scottish Government perspective, we did respond uh, to the guideline uh, at the time. What I'll also say to Polly McNeill, and I'm happy to send her more details, she may have seen this uh, already, of course, when it comes to this particular guideline, uh, there is a, a mountain of evidence, about 122 pages of Edinburgh University research, which helped to inform that sentencing guideline when it came to the issues of cognitive uh, maturity uh, within uh, the justice uh, system, and particularly amongst uh, young uh, people. So for me, it's absolutely right that the decisions on sentencing are for the independent judiciary. Now, where the Parliament has an interest, of course, it is fine for uh, Polly McNeill to bring forward a member's bill. If she thinks the government should be bringing forward legislation on a matter, I'm more than happy to consider that. But it must be the case, it must always be the case, even in those cases where, it, where there are particularly heinous crimes, that sentencing is always a matter for the independent judiciary and should be, uh, should be free from any political interference uh, whatsoever. We'll move to general and constituency supplementaries um, and questions and responses should be brief. And I call Alistair Allen. Last night, CalMac announced it would yet again be abandoning ferry services from South Uist for virtually all of June to make up for issues elsewhere. In a statement that could only have been written a long way from South Uist, customers were advised that they could get to Oban and Mali via either Barra or Sky instead. What more can the Scottish Government do to challenge uh, CalMac's decision, given that this community has already seen a third of its uh, services cancelled during the last year? First Minister. I can thank Alistair Allen for raising what is an incredibly important uh, issue for uh, his uh, constituents. I know many uh, members will uh, have an interest in this issue uh, as well. Can I say, first and foremost, uh, I will ensure that the Transport Minister reflects the uh, point about comms, because we know uh, this is an issue, again, that has been raised time and time again by our island uh, communities, who, of course, uh, are feeling anger and frustration uh, in relation to the latest developments uh, and, and, and uh, want to hear better communication uh, when there is, uh, unfortunately, disruption 
to the ferry uh, services. Uh, I do recognise the significant impact that this particular disruption will have in the communities in use. I know the Minister for Transport has made very clear to CalMAC that they must continue to explore every single avenue possible to keep this disruption to an absolute minimum. Uh, the Minister not only visited North and South Uist uh, last week, he met with South Uist Business Impact Group uh, earlier this morning. I haven't had a readout uh, from that meeting, but I will uh, make sure I do uh, shortly after uh, First Minister's questions. And I will, as Alistair Allen has asked uh, me to do, uh, ensure that uh, CalMAC are exploring every single avenue possible to minimise this disruption as much as they possibly can. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I raise the plight of a vulnerable and deteriorating individual with severe learning difficulties who is in the care of Dumfries and Galloway Council, but for complex reasons has ended up trapped in a residential home in the south of England. For over a year, her sister has been desperately trying to get her back home closer to family. At every turn, social work have deliberately obstructed this and seem to be willing the lady to die or become too weak to travel in order to save themselves cost and hassle. Despite notice being served by the existing home and a best interest meeting agreeing with the family that she should return to Scotland, progress has been extremely limited. If I provide her details privately, will the First Minister step in and ensure her human dignity is respected? First Minister. I, of course, uh, am happy to look at the details uh, of the case, and of course, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, and Social Care will also uh, look at the details uh, of the case. If there is some way that we can assist, uh, then we will uh, do that. But of course, I would say uh, to, to, to uh, Oliver Mundell, and I'm sure he does understand this, uh, that it is really important that uh, we do not uh, overstep in terms of professional decision making or indeed clinical decision making uh, that may well be a factor in this particular case. But I hear uh, what, uh, what Oliver Mundell uh, has to say. Uh, he makes a very powerful contribution on behalf uh, of his constituents. I can't imagine what their family are going through. Uh, and therefore, of course, I will uh, look at the detail uh, if Oliver Mundell sends that to me uh, shortly after First Minister's questions. Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. New forecasts from the Scottish Fiscal Commission show a concerning gap between eligibility and uptake of the Scottish Child Payment, projecting that over 60,000 families could miss out. This disparity is most pronounced among children between 6 and 15, with only 80% of that age cohort estimated to take the payment up, compared with 92% for under 6s. The child payment was unanimously supported across this parliament, but, presiding officer, the payment only has the ability to change lives if people are aware they are entitled and, crucially, are supported to apply for it. Therefore, I would ask the First Minister, if he is serious, as he says, about tackling poverty, Will he investigate and address this concerning disparity between eligibility and uptake of the child payment to ensure that it has the fullest impact that we all support? First Minister. I, I, given an assurance that this is a key area of focus uh, for the Government, the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice uh, and I have had a conversation uh, already, and there's already good work being undertaken in relation to marketing awareness to make sure that we do everything we possibly can so that every single person that is eligible for that game-changing intervention uh, does uh, take it up. As I mentioned already, I was in Castlebury uh, High School only this week talking to school children, talking to parents who have benefited from that positive uh, intervention. Uh, we've made uh, excellent progress in the extension of the Scottish Child Payment uh, to under uh, 16s. Statistics, as I have already said, show that 303,000 children were in receipt by the end uh, of March. But I can give Paul O'Kane an absolute assurance uh, we are working hard to do what we can to continue to raise awareness so that everybody who is eligible uh, can take up that game-changing Scottish child payment. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, following FMQs today, I'll be holding a members' debate on encouraging women and girls into STEM. So, given the importance of STEM, in particular to the North East economy and its role in Scotland's transition to net zero, can I ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to motivate women and girls to pursue careers in STEM? First Minister. Well, can I thank uh, Audrey Nicholl for the excellent work uh, that she uh, is doing, and my apologies that I can't make uh, the event uh, later on. We know, of course, that uh, the more effort we put in relation to STEM and ensuring that we get more women and girls into STEM subjects, 
is beneficial, uh, not just uh, for them, but of course for the economy uh, going forward in Scotland. So there's a range of interventions that we are taking forward. I'm happy to uh, write to Audrey Nicholl with the detail of all the interventions uh, that we are taking forward in relation to this particular issue. But it is an absolute win-win. The more we invest in encouraging, women, uh, encouraging girls uh, into STEM uh, subjects, the better it is for the economy uh, as a whole, and everybody benefits as a result of it. Willie Rennie. The First Minister knows that many experienced staff are departing the private and voluntary nursery sector because those nurseries receive lower fees than those in the councils, because during the leadership contest he promised to close that gap. Is he going to commit to delivering that, as he said, in the next budget for 23-24? Is he going to keep the promise? First Minister. Well, is right. I did promise to, of course, look at the issue and understand uh, very clearly the, the concerns that are raised, uh, particularly by the PVI sector. And he'll have heard from a previous response uh, that the Minister, uh, Natalie Dawn, uh, met with the sector just uh, recently. Willie Rennie may also be aware um, that uh, despite having the highest rates uh, in the UK uh, in 22-23, both the Scottish Government and local government recognise the need to strengthen the process of rate setting and we're working with COSLA to take forward an evidence-based sustainable rates uh, review and that will be reporting uh, soon. So I am, I am absolutely determined, absolutely focused uh, to ensure that we're supporting uh, the PVI sector who are so, so crucial uh, in helping us to expand uh, that exceptional uh, offer uh, of uh, free childcare uh, uh, right, across this, uh, right across the country. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Liam Kerr. Very grateful. When failing to answer Douglas Ross earlier, the First Minister said the UK Government has given, quote, not a single penny of funding towards the Scottish Cluster or the ACORN project. Now, anyone in command of his brief would know that the UK Government has, in fact, given over £40 million to the Scottish Whoa. Cluster. Whoa. And, President Officer, in light of John Swinney voluntarily correcting the record following his misleading the Chamber last night, would the presiding officer advise the First Minister on how he might correct his latest gaffe? Um, the members will be aware that the chair is not responsible for the content of members' contributions. Um, uh, of course, we would always expect that the contents of responses address specific questions put and that where members become aware of any inaccuracy, the take the measures that are available to them in order to, to make any corrections. Thank you. There will be a brief suspension before we move on to members' business. Thank you.